Thank you. you. May be seated. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. We'll begin reading at verse 10. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for worship. And they neither found me in the temple, disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias the chief captain shall come down, I will know the utmost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning <clears throat> the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Felix was a cruel and licentious ruler. He is on his third wife, whom he stole from another man. Drusilla was the sister of Agrippa II and Bernice, which we will hear from shortly. And they were all the grandchildren of Herod the Great and children of the Herod that was eaten of worms after he killed James and imprisoned Peter. Felix had started out as a, as a slave, and due to his brother becoming a favorite of Caesar, he was put in a king's position in AD 52. He only lasted eight years because of his cruel and poor judgment. And after, in AD 60, he was sent to Rome to be punished. And if it had not been also for his brother <laughs> Pallas, uh, who was a favorite of Caesar, he probably would have been executed or punished severely. Drusilla was an infamous, infamous, yet beautiful Jewess, daughter of Herod Agrippa I, who was eaten of worms, as I said. She had been married to Azizus, king of the Emesenes, but left him and married Felix. Felix here is standing before Paul. Paul... Felix thinks is on trial when he doesn't know that it's not Paul that's on trial. It's Felix that's on trial. It's Drusilla that is on trial. He re reasoned with him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. What God thinks about it, what God wants you to do about it, and what God's going to do about it if you don't. Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. He heard it. This was his grand opportunity. The only opportunity before he would lose his soul and face an angry God. He trembled. He knew it was right. He had struggles within himself. He was wrestling within himself, but he put it off. <clears throat> he was looking for a bribe. He didn't find a bribe. Instead, he lost his kingdom and his soul. 
Turn to Acts 26. Again, Paul is in the audience of the elite, the rich, the powerful, the families who have, uh, they consider themselves the upper crust in society. <coughs> then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused to the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most greatest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You notice he doesn't tell Agrippa about Jesus of Nazareth or about the resurrection. They all knew about it. They knew, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints. He didn't have to tell them who those were. Did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests? And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them uh, to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. As he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. When he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that, were with, that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So we have Festus. Not much is known about this man, but he died within a couple of years of this interview. He died within a couple of years of taking Felix's office. Agrippa II, the great-grandson of Herod the Great, uh, the son of Agrippa, Herod Agrippa I, he died around A.D. 100. He reigned 51 years. 
Bernice was his sister. She was married to her uncle, uh, another Herod, king of Chalcis, on whose death she lived with her brother Agrippa II. They were, they were not godly people. They were all licentious, very much like the rich of our day. They were educated. They were powerful. Their marriages were off and on here and there. Uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage, and, and uh, uh, other ungodly activities. Agrippa II and Bernice, uh, there was a big question mark over there, the appropriateness of their relationship. Festus, after hearing all this, was probably in a similar fix as Felix. He could see that there was a lot of truth here. Some things he didn't want to deal with, he didn't want to open his mind to. It's easier to slam the door and say, you're crazy. You can't expect us to follow this. You are unbalanced. You're beside yourself. Felix trembled and put it off to later. Festus slammed the door and accused the preacher of being crazy and unbalanced. Agrippa, who had been raised uh, in Judaism, knew the customs, just like Paul said. He was sitting there, listening, <clears throat> knowing that what Paul said were words of truth and soberness. He said, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that None of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Yes, this Herod Agrippa, his grandfather, tried to kill baby Jesus. His great uncle had slain John the Baptist and mocked Jesus with his soldiers. His father had killed James and imprisoned Peter before he was eaten of worms and died. Yes, Agrippa knew what Paul was talking about. Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on thee I'll call. Almost persuaded harvest is past. Almost persuaded doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail, almost, but lost. We see around us in society, we see the Felixes, we see the Festuses, and we see the Agrippas. We see the Drusillas, and we see the Bernices. They're all over the place. And they all re react in about this same way. They tremble. They go away. I'll talk to you later about this. I don't want to talk about this right now. They're rich and powerful, gaining the world and losing their soul. The Festuses of today say, you're mad. You're, you're unbalanced. That's, you can't expect everybody to live that way. The Agrippas look on. They struggle within. Almost. But lost. Ultimately, they all agreed on one point. What Paul was asking them to do was not a balanced view of life. You couldn't expect everyone to do that. Paul said, I would that not everyone here, we're not almost, but all together, such as I am. Except these chains. He said, I believe that every single person can be just like I am. Believe just what I'm believing. They can attend to righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come and be in line with that. They can see what God says is right. They can do about it what God says to do about it. So then they can face God on judgment day without facing wrath. Paul said, I believe that is reasonable. I believe it is balanced. And they said, no, you are unbalanced. I have a question today. What is balanced? What is balanced thinking? What does it mean to be balanced or unbalanced? You know, in the, the icon of justice, you see a, a woman with a blindfold and you see 
a, uh, a balance. <clears throat> and basically what it is, it's a gadget that has two trays being suspended. <coughs> the idea is that you have a weight. Something that is a known weight, and it's known to be a pound. You put it in this side, and then on this side you put in so many uh, whatever you want to put so you know when you have a pound. Okay, that's one aspect of a balance. That's why God says He loves a just weight. Uh, Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. If I were selling wheat, I would have a balance in the olden days, and I would put a pound weight over here, and then there would be a big enough area here, I would fill with wheat until it came up even, and I would know I was selling them a pound of wheat. An unjust weight is a, a weight that is not actually a pound, so you're actually giving them less than what they should get. Okay? In the matters of justice, you also have the balance weighing the prosecution and the defense, weighing the evidence, okay, and taking everything into consideration. So. The idea of being balanced is to properly weigh the evidence, okay? Balanced judgment gives the same weight to everyone, just like when you're selling wheat. Every element of judgment is working toward the proper goal and nothing is working contrary. All right, that's the idea of balanced. If you have a balanced diet, it's the same thing. You don't have some nutrition and some poison. They're working against each other. In a balanced diet, you don't have way too much iron in proportion to the other minerals. Okay, that could kill something. So you have enough iron to where you have everything proportioned out in a balanced diet so that everything is working toward the goal of health. If it's not a balanced diet, that means there's something in there working contrary to the goal of health. Okay? It is out of balance because there's something that's opposing the goal. And it's not working towards the goal. When you have a balanced tire, the weight is proportioned for the optimal efficiency of the tire. If you have too much weight on one side, that tire is going to work against itself. Okay? The, the rolling down the road is going to be bouncing down the road. It, the automobile will not be reaching its optimal efficiency because something is working against itself. And so when it's properly proportioned, nothing is working contrary to the goal, and therefore it goes down the road smoothly and gets the best gas mileage, the best efficiency. If you have a balanced checkbook, <coughs> it means every transaction is properly accounted for and there is no deception in the conclusion, in the sum, in the balance. Everything's properly accounted for and it comes out right. It is not a wrong conclusion, it's a right conclusion. If you have balance in the body, <coughs> there are people <coughs> and there are people who have really good balance. They can walk a tightrope. Okay? If you can't walk a tightrope, it's because there's something in your senses working against the goal. Okay? If I lose my balance, it's because I have a sensation that is contrary to the goal. Something is opposing the other senses. So, <coughs> where one sense is right on, the other sense is feeling like I'm too far to the right, too far to the left. There are senses within my body, and they're not all working harmonious. Something is working against itself, and therefore I lose my balance. If you have balanced child training, you have appropriate demand, balanced with consideration of ability. You have appropriate discipline, balanced with praise and encouragement. You have appropriate fun, balanced with training. You have appropriate work, balanced with rest. You have appropriate book education balanced with hands-on labor. What does it mean? What does balanced mean? It means that everything you're doing is working for the same goal appropriately. Right. You don't have too much book education and not enough hands-on. That works against the efficiency of this person. All right? 
But when everything is proportioned properly, when you have balanced training, that person reaches their highest efficiency. Because nothing is opposing something else within the situation. You have relationships. It's, a, it's important to have appropriate time in fellowship, balanced with minding your own business. Appropriate giving, balanced with taking. Appropriate reproof, balanced with appreciation. Appropriate loyalty, balanced with accountability. Mm -hmm. And then you have everything working towards perfection. Yes. All right? Nothing is damaging the relationship. Everything is adding to it. Everything is prospering it. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm trying to get through this cold that I had. So balance is basically when everything is taken into consideration and everything is guided towards the same goal, nothing is opposing itself within you. Uh, the efficiency is at its highest because everything is geared in the right direction, working together for a common good, common goal. The highest good, right? Right. When a balanced diet, balanced tire, balanced relationships. Turn to 2 Timothy 2.25. <laughs> Begin in verse 24. Thank you. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. They do what? Instructing those that oppose themselves. Mm -hmm. An unbalanced tire opposes itself. An unbalanced diet opposes itself. These people in their thinking are working against themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Acknowledging of the truth helps them to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So, God is balanced. God's word is balanced. God's truth is meant to balance us. God's law takes everything into account and evenly meets out judgments for one common goal of righteousness, love, and holiness, creating ultimate happiness. But if there's something in the ingredients that is opposed to the goal of the whole, it's working against itself. Have you ever, he said to Paul, Paul, thou art beside thyself. <coughs> you know what that means? It comes from the idea that when someone is a little bit loose upstairs, they argue with themselves. They oppose themselves. They talk to themselves. But they don't just talk to themselves. They argue with themselves. They are beside them. Like there's another person there. They are beside themselves. Okay? But being beside yourself has to do with opposing yourself, mm -hmm. fighting against yourself, arguing with yourself. <clears throat> Righteousness, what God thinks about it. Temperance, what God expects you to do about it. Judgment to come, what God's going to do about it if you don't. This is all meant to get you lined up in one direction, not opposing yourself, not working against yourself, balanced. Everything working for the common good. We who seek God's word are following words of truth and soberness. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They're fighting against themselves. They know better, but they don't do better. There's a conflict there. They're struggling. They're unbalanced. And verse uh, 32 of that same chapter says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's crazy. That's, that is unbalanced. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. That person is unbalanced. They are opposing themselves. John 3.20 
For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So what does he know? He knows that when people see what he's doing, it's going to be reproved. He knows that what he's doing is evil, that what he's doing he doesn't want people to see. He knows that he's working against his own well-being. Is that reasonable? Paul said that men should repent, turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. That's reasonable. That's balanced. Mm -hmm. That's right thinking. <coughs> so we say to the Felixes, who are trembling and resisting God's Spirit, we say to the Felixes, who are fighting against themselves, opposing themselves, you're unbalanced. You're not taking everything into consideration. Your checkbook, your checkbook is missing an entry. You're not lining up. Everything is not coming out kosher. You're the tire going down the road where something is working against itself. You're, you're jiggling the car. You're shaking the car to pieces. You're losing efficiency. Why? Because there's elements in you that are opposed to the ultimate goal of happiness. You are opposing yourself. You're the diet. It doesn't bring health. It's an unbalanced diet. <clears throat> we say to the Festuses, you who in a couple years will be dead. This is your interview with the Apostle Paul. You're sitting here. You've had two interviews. You've heard this man give his testimony twice now. And you're sitting there listening. You know that what he's saying is reasonable. But it condemns you. It makes you in a place that is dangerous. It shows you that you are working for your own ruin. But instead of repenting, you slam the door on reasons. You are mad. You're crazy. Leave me alone. <laughs> Who's crazy? What they don't think, what they don't understand is this. The apostle, God's chosen apostle. Though he were in chains, he was not on trial. They thought he was the one on trial. God said to Paul, when he was in Jerusalem, I'm going to send you, you're going to testify before kings and governors. They were on trial. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the word of God, friend, you're on trial. Right. When it comes to the preacher's preaching, you say, that preacher's crazy. I'm not on trial. I'm standing with the Word of God. I'm standing with the ultimate in balance. Everything taken into account. Everything properly proportioned for my good and God's glory. Everything perfectly just. No respect to persons. No partiality. Everything meted out equally. And by me meditating in this, by me living in this, by me studying this, by me living it, obeying it, and preaching it, I'm becoming balanced. The more of this that I live and know and do, the more balanced I become. The more you fight and struggle and resist, the more you oppose yourself, the more imbalanced you become. <clears throat> I was sharing the Word of God with someone not too long ago. Oh, I don't believe that way. This person's life is in a wreck. I said, so how's that working out for you? you you're so smart. You, don't, you can't receive the Word of God. You don't believe that way. Well, how's that working out? There goes that tire down the road about to knock the fender off. <clears throat> To the Agrippas. They see the truth. They claim to believe the prophets. It's their own religion. They almost believe it. They almost follow it. They're almost persuaded. They're struggling with the price tag. Seek to gain the world while you lose your own soul? Is that crazy or what? Who knowing the judgment of God that they would commit such things 
are worthy of death, not only do the same, but take pleasure in them that do them? Provoking God to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? You're crazy. Disregarding God's word, casting His word behind your back while you go on and do your own thing? You're crazy. That's unbalanced. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Instructing those who are unbalanced. Instructing those who, on one hand, want to be happy, and on the other, other hand, are doing the things to destroy happiness. On one hand, they, want to, they say they want to be successful, but they're doing the very things that ruin your success. They say they want, they want God to be happy with them. And then they turn around and cast His Word behind their back. They say they want to go to heaven. And then they do the very things that send people to hell. Is that balanced? No. That's crazy. <clears throat> if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that God's going to repent for them. It doesn't mean that God's going to make them repent. It means that God would continue His conviction. And if they repent, He would accept it. He would grant it. There are people who have offended God to the point where his spirit is withdrawn and they are left to their own being. And on judgment day, like Esau, they're going to weep and cry. But there will be no place for repentance. God will not give them repentance. He will not grant them repentance. In other words, he will not accept that option. They will not have that option. That option will have been passed and done. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, the truth, everything taken into account, Genesis to Revelation, the truth, every bit of it, all of it, you take out any part of it, it's no longer the truth, is it? It's balanced. A balanced diet. Truth, all working efficiently together for our eternal good. Truth. Taking everything into account without partiality. Truth. Meeting out to every man what is equal and just and loving. God has a weight. He has His Word. And he puts it on this side. It's the same Word for every man. It's the same principle for every man. He's not partial. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter what family you're raised in. It doesn't matter what color you are, how tall you are. You're going to be weighed against the same thing everyone else is weighed against. It's just. It's fair. It's balanced. To rescue unbalanced people. The world would like to look at us sitting here with our dresses and head coverings and modest apparel, orderly families, orderly church, uh, the, what we believe, why we believe it, how we operate, and they would like to say, uh, I'll talk to you later. You're crazy. You can't expect everybody to live that way. They like to say, well, it looks really good. I almost am persuaded. The fact that they aren't persuaded, the fact that they slam the door, the fact that they put it off, there's something down inside there that makes them think that we are extreme. And they don't have to be. The question is, are we extreme? Extreme has to do with being unbalanced in that, in that terminology. Okay? Are we unbalanced? If we are unbalanced, how would we get balanced? 
If there's an imbalance in your life, there's only one way, there's only one person who can see everything at once, who can take everything into account, who knows the past and the future, who knows what's best for his creation. There's only one being who can make you balanced. That's right. And that's the Lord. That's right. There's only one message. There's only one book that is perfectly balanced and will balance those who read it, those who meditate in it, those who strive to obey it in its proper context, in its entirety. So if we are unbalanced, we need to get in the Word deeper. <coughs> we need to obey it better. We need to know it more. That's right. Abandoning the Word is not going to balance us. We're not talking, when we talk about a balanced diet, it's not balanced between nutrition and poison. That's right. Okay? We're not, we talk about a balanced diet, we're not talking about being balanced between blown up and flat. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about balance between efficient and inefficient. That's not balanced. We're talking about that which makes efficiency. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> okay? In a court of justice, they don't balance between truth and lie. A balanced and a just weight is that which is everything taken into account and dealt with appropriately. That is balanced. There's a lot of people who think they're balanced who are opposing themselves. The definition of imbalance is that which opposes itself. In any realm. You take an engine that's out of balance, it'll destroy itself. You take an engine that's perfectly balanced, it'll run and run and run. Beautiful. High RPM doesn't hurt it. But if that engine is out of balance, if they have not balanced that engine, it will destroy itself. Because there are elements opposing the efficiency. The world... They think they're going to get balanced. Instead of meditating in the Word of God, they meditate on meditation. Seriously. Instead of uh, believing the Word of God, they believe in believing. Instead of having faith in God's Word, they have faith in faith. They like those words. They put little things on their walls. Faith, hope, love. And you ask them, what, what do I do with this problem? Just have faith. Just trust. They trust in trusting. They don't trust in God. Trusting in God means obeying God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Having faith in God means doing what He said. Right. Meditating in the Word of God means reading it and listening to it. But they don't do that. They sit and they meditate on meditation. They sit there and try to empty their mind and think about the fact that they are meditating. Ask them. I've seen it. <clears throat> Just recently, someone sent me a clip of some teacher on meditation. And what was he talking about? He was talking about the emptiness of awareness. And how you had to have perfect emptiness before experience could enter into awareness. He was meditating on meditation. They look in themselves for a savior. They look inside their dying body to find God. They look inside their own mind and feelings for guidance and truth. That only comes from God. Sitting down and meditating, emptying your mind, and listening to yourself is not going to give you the answers from God's Word. Right. Mm -hmm. Trusting, just trusting, and going on your presumptuous way is not going to bring God's favor. You're trusting in trust. Oh, I, I'm, I'm just having faith. I believe if I just have enough faith. You're having faith in your faith. 
I've, in Christian literature all over the place, you can find these concepts of having faith in faith. And therefore, they try to work in having more faith. So if they have enough faith, something will happen. But all they're doing is having faith in their ability to have faith. That's unbalanced, folks. Let me ask you. Are you opposing yourself? Are there elements within you that are working one way and elements within you working the other way? If you were a tire, would you run smoothly down the road or would you be jiggling the fenders off? Is everything within you working for the same goal? Or are there issues within you? Elements working against the goal while other elements work for the goal. That's imbalance. There's only way, one way to get balanced. This book, when read, obeyed, studied, meditated on, will balance the mind. Amen. It will balance the heart. It will balance the affections. It will make it to where everything in you is working towards the goal. Nothing opposing itself. So you're not... You're not accusing the preacher of being mad and crazy while you yourself are imbalanced. The world we live in is greatly unbalanced. Our government is greatly unbalanced. You got forces working for the destruction of the nation and forces working for the preservation of the nation. You got forces working for the destruction of our Constitution and forces working for the preservation of the Constitution. And forces that are there and don't really know what they're doing. You got churches. Part pulling towards the Bible and part pulling towards the world. And is it, is it any wonder that nothing is getting accomplished like it should be? Is it any wonder that society is self-destructing? <coughs> what about your life? What about your marriage? What about your relationships? Are you balanced? Most likely there is a need for some balancing. Most likely you would have to admit before God that you in many ways work against yourself and oppose yourself and that there is a conflict within there's some something on the scale that shouldn't be there there is some weight misproportioned in that tire it's not going to last long What's the lifespan of a highly imbalanced tire? Well, Brother Daniel learned the lifespan of a, uh, a front end alignment that was out of whack, of a tire. You want to make your tires bald real quick, right? But an unbalanced tire. Go down the roadway. So what's going to happen? It's going to self-destruct. And so will your vehicle. So who's crazy? Was Paul crazy? <coughs> Felix self-destructed. Agrippa self-destructed. Paul's in chains and they're on the throne. Now they're in hell and he's in glory. Let's stand together. Balance. The balanced thinker. Are you balanced in your thinking?
Any thoughts before we go to prayer? You know, all you have to do to get a, a perfectly balanced tire out of balance is add a little bit of weight where it doesn't belong. Right. And the devil knows all you have to do to get it out of balance is just add a little weight where it doesn't belong. <clears throat> a little bit of something that doesn't belong in your life or disproportional to get you balancing and off track. The same goes with a diet. The same goes with a balancing your checkbook. The same goes with justice in a courtroom. Something added where it does not belong. <laughs>